All right. So I'm assuming you can see my screen. Yep, you're good. All right. So yeah, thanks everyone for coming. And please feel free to ask questions, uh, as Mark said. And uh, there might be a bit of a delay between you typing the question and me hearing it, but I'll do my best to answer them. OK, so today I wanted to tell you about a recent project that I worked on. It was a fun project on whether quantum computers could speed up gradient descent. And this work is now available. Um, it's on the archive, the archive numbers at the bottom. And this is joint work with collaborators at Microsoft Research India. Uh, Ankit Garg, Praneet Netrapali, and Suhail Sharif, who was an um, intern at Microsoft Research India at the time this work was done. And I want to tell you not just about the result itself, but the the story, the, you know, how we came up with this problem or why did we choose this problem to study and kind of just tell you about how research projects go. Like it's often not, they don't start out with a fully formed question for which you have a fully formed line of attack and you just solve the problem. Uh, the, the more common scenario is you start with some vague idea of a problem that you'd like to attack and then you go down a bunch of winding roads and you reach somewhere. And that's kind of what happened here. And um, I think it's an interesting story and it kind of highlights how the research process works. And I'll try to stay high level because I, I don't want to assume that everyone in the audience is a um, quantum computing researcher, but I assume that you're here because you're interested in quantum computing and, and you have some familiarity with the subject. OK, so let me let me start. Um, so let's let's start with some motivation for this talk. And in fact, before I get to talking about gradient descent, um, as was said in the introduction, the my motivation for studying quantum computing is I want to understand what problems can be solved on quantum computers faster than can be solved on classical computers. So as most of you know, hopefully quantum computers can solve some problems faster than traditional classical computers, but not all. And, and part of the challenge in quantum computing research is identifying which are these problems. So we don't want to waste quantum computing time solving problems for which there is no quantum speed up. Of course, we want to find uh, interesting problems for which there's a quantum speed up and the problems are hopefully useful and find applications. So that's that's the overarching theme, theme of my work. Uh, where, where can quantum computers give you speed ups? And often the question uh, can be answered either, either positively or negatively. Like you, you come up with an application domain and then you investigate whether quantum computers can give you a speed up. And sometimes the answer is negative, that no quantum computers can't give you speed ups. And that's very useful to know as well, because then you won't spend time looking for applications in this domain. Um, OK, so as an example of this kind of question, our work started with um, gradient descent. So let, let me tell you a little bit about gradient descent. I don't want to assume that people know this algorithm, although it's a very popular algorithm and you see it all over the place um, in machine learning optimization. And OK, so let me tell you a quick, quick crash course on what, what gradient descent is. So gradient descent is an algorithm for minimizing functions. So you have some function f. It's from Rn to R. So what that means is it, it takes as input n real numbers and it outputs a real number. And you want to try to minimize this function. So this function could stand for anything um, uh, commonly it's used in machine learning, where this function might be the error that your um, machine learning model makes on the data that it's seen. But this function really could, could just be anything, and you're interested in minimizing it. It's used in practice uh, a lot. Um, and interestingly, it's used both as a heuristic and in settings with provable guarantees. And let me just explain these two different uh, settings in which you use algorithms. Uh, a heuristic algorithm is one where you have an algorithm for solving a problem, but you don't necessarily know that it works um, or you can't, there's no, there's no mathematical proof that it'll, it'll find the correct answer for you or that it'll always find the correct answer. And often this is fine in practice because maybe it usually finds the right answer and that's good enough. Or, or in some settings, even if it doesn't always find the right find the right answer, you have the ability to check whether the final answer is correct or not. So, so it's okay to use a heuristic. Uh, so one very uh, used application of gradient descent is for training neural networks, and here it's used as a heuristic. So we we don't really understand whether gradient descent actually finds the minimum, but 
it seems to work really well in practice. Uh, and there are many other scenarios where gradient descent works um, uh, optimally in the sense that it actually finds the right answer and you can prove this. And the one very rich setting is convex optimization, which I'll, I'll talk about later in this work. Um, OK, so gradient descent, popular algorithm used all over the place. Um, and the idea is very simple. It's just um, the following strategy. You're trying to minimize the function and what you do is you you're at some point X, so it's probably easiest to understand by using an example. So let, let's think of the function as being the, the height and it's a function is a variable of is a function of two parameters. Let's say the X and Y coordinates. So let me take a very real example. Maybe you're going you're hiking in the mountains and now the, the height of the where you are. So the height of the mountain. At your location, that's this function is computing that uh, function and N is two. So there's because there's only there's two coordinates, maybe the latitude and longitude. And you're trying to minimize this function, so you're you're hiking in the mountains and you're trying to, I guess, get to the, the bottom. You're trying to get to the valley. Um, and I. Of course, if you can, if you can just look around, like if you just look all around you and you can just spot the valley, then there's not much of a there's not an optimization problem. You just walk towards the valley, so we want to make the problem a little harder and we only want to use local information, so the information that you can see around yourself. And this happens uh, very frequently that you cannot see the whole function at one glance. And like uh, if you've been hiking here in in, in Washington, you, you'll, you'll notice that there's very tall trees. And so you can actually look around you, just scan and be like, oh, there's the valley. Let me go walk there. So all you can do is you can figure out, you know where you are and you can look around you, but you can't look far away. So what would be the, the simplest thing you can do is wherever you are, just kind of walk in the downhill direction because, well, you don't know anything else like that seems like the best bet. Just walk downhill and that's the basic idea of gradient descent. So I drew a little picture to demonstrate what this would be. Now this is not a two dimensional function because it's kind of hard to draw 3D stuff. So it's a, it's a one dimensional function. So the X axis is the function variable input and the Y axis is the function. So maybe you start at X zero. So this is your starting point and you say, oh, downhill is this way and then you walk you take a step this way and then you reach this point X1 and then you say OK downhill is this way and you walk this way and so on. So that's intuitively how gradient descent works and I can say this a little more formally. Um, formally an iteration of gradient descent just says uh, you start at Xi so Xi is where you currently are. That's your current position and then you evaluate the gradient at Xi. So the gradient is this this formalization of this intuitive idea of just fi figure out the direction in which you're decreasing the most. It's the it's the slope, basically. It's a multi-dimensional analog of the the derivative. And you walk in the direction of minus the gradient because the gradient tells you the direction of steepest ascent, tells you where you're going to go up. So you want to go down. So you put a minus sign and and eta is the length of the step. So you know this example of walking in the mountains. Uh, you might uh, you might take one step or you might take 10 steps in the direction of steepest descent and then you might reevaluate your choice. So you know you've reached somewhere new and then again you check oh, where, where should I go now? And uh, yeah, I, I don't want to assume that everybody knows what the gradient is. This function is just this is a formal definition. So derivative uh, it's a vector of partial derivatives, but um, if you're not too comfortable with calculus, it doesn't doesn't really matter. You can just always keep having this intuitive version in your mind. That the gradient is just uh, the slope in, in that. Uh, at that point, it, it points towards the direction of steepest ascent, and so minus the gradient points towards the, the downward direction. OK. Good, so if there's any questions, please feel free to post them in chat. All right, so that was my uh, crash course on gradient descent. And right, so what is this project about? The project is about can quantum computers speed up gradient descent? All right, so this was the question we we started with, and it's kind of clear why this question is interesting because gradient descent is used all over the place, as I was saying. And if quantum computers could give you a speed up for gradient descent, then you could use it for any of the applications that gradient descent is used for. You know, for example, training neural networks. That would be pretty cool. And so. Right, so, so research project might start out with an intuitive question like this. Can quantum computers speed up gradient descent? And yeah, you want to think about this for a little while and then um, 
as soon as we posed the question, it became clear that this question, it's not clear that the question is meaningful, right? And like, what, what does this question mean? Can quantum computer speed up gradient descent? And as, as an example, let's look at the problem of factoring numbers. And here we know that, you know, one of the main applications of quantum computing uh, that's known where it gives an exponential speed up over classical algorithms is the factoring problem. And we know that on quantum computers, Shor's algorithm can factor numbers um, exponentially faster than the best classical algorithm for factorization. So let's take this as an example. Would you say that Shor's algorithm speeds up the best known classical algorithm for factorization? Um, I, I don't think that's true. In fact, the classical algorithm for factorization looks nothing like Shor's algorithm. It's just a different algorithm. The The commonality is that they're solving the same problem. So it, I don't think it's meaningful to say that Shor's algorithm speeds up this particular classical algorithm. It just solves the factorization problem faster than the classical algorithm does. So there's, uh, it's not totally obvious how to formalize this question. And so, for example, here's a unhelpful way to formalize the question, which is we will say that a quantum algorithm speeds up gradient descent if it does exactly what gradient descent does. So if it uh, outputs the same sequence of points, x0, x1, x2, and so on, that appear in the iterations of gradient descent. In other words, we're asking the quantum algorithm to exactly mimic the classical algorithm. But of course, if you ask the quantum algorithm to do that, then there's nothing, we're not gonna get a speed up because then the quantum algorithm is just doing what the classical algorithm is doing. That's, so then you couldn't possibly get a speed up. So that's that's not the right way to formalize the question. The example of Shor's algorithm kind of gives you a hint with how you should formalize this question because although this is unhelpful and not, not a very meaningful way to formalize the question. It is meaningful to say that quantum computers solve a certain problem faster than gradient descent. So in the example of Shor's algorithm, Shor's algorithm solves the factorization problem uh, faster than any classical algorithm. So let's take this as our motivation. So we want to choose a problem and then compare quantum computers ability to solve the problem to the ability of gradient descent to solve the problem. But of course, you have to choose a problem that gradient descent is actually good at solving because otherwise even other classical algorithms would solve the problem faster than gradient descent. All right, so you have to somehow choose a problem that characterizes gradient descent for which gradient descent is the, the best classical algorithm, like it is uniquely suited to solving that problem. Um, and so this is how we choose to formalize this problem. We say, you know, consider some problem that can be solved by gradient descent and furthermore for which gradient descent is the optimal classical algorithm. That means among classical algorithms, it is the best algorithm. So in other words, this problem is somehow really capturing the power of gradient descent. And then we can ask, can quantum computers solve this problem faster than gradient descent solves it? Which is equivalent to asking if quantum computers can solve this problem faster than any classical algorithm. Because as we said, for this problem, gradient descent is the best classical algorithm. And that's how we choose to formalize our problem. And fortunately, there's a canonical problem that fits the bill perfectly. Uh, it's an it's an introductory textbook on convex optimization, and so the like the problem just presents itself, and I'll introduce that problem on the next slide. But maybe I'll pause now in case there are any questions. All right, good. If not, let me give you um, a quick crash course on convex optimization. OK, so what is the field of convex optimization? At a very high level, convex optimization is the problem of minimizing a convex function over a convex set. Um, a convex function is a function, so the formal definition is that if you take the function and take any two points on the function and join them, this segment should lie above the function. So here I've just drawn by hand a couple of examples of convex functions. The one on the light, on the left, we've joined two points and that, that segment is above the function. Uh, the second example, we drew a segment, but the segment is below the function, so that's not good. Uh, the third example shows a discontinuous function, so such a function is not convex because you can draw this green line, and it will lie below the function. And the fourth example shows a function that's convex, but it's not smooth, so there's there's a point at the bottom where it's um, the function is continuous, but it, it changes slope abruptly, so it's not differentiable at that point, so that's fine. Convex functions don't need to be differentiable. 
And the other important part of convex optimization is you work with a convex set. Uh, and a convex set is just a set where if you join any two points, the, the segment joining those two points lies inside the set. Throughout this talk, the set's always going to be just a ball of radius R. So we, you don't really need to uh, worry about complicated convex sets appearing in this talk. OK, so this is the field of convex optimization. And uh, perhaps the most basic question here that you could ask in this setting is you want to minimize a function and we'll, we'll always allow approximate minimization of the function because maybe you can't figure out the exact minimum, but you just want to get close to it. You want to get epsilon close to it. Uh, you want to minimize this function over some convex set. And as I said, we'll just take a, a nice ball of some radius. So I'm going to take a ball of radius capital R uh, around the origin. So the all zeros vector. I want to minimize this function. And what do I know about the function? Um, the function is convex. And so any convex function um, over this ball will have bounded Lipschitz constant. So let me let me tell you what that is. The Lipschitz constant is just a, a number that captures how quickly the function can change. So if you, if you think about this, if a function changes very rapidly, it's going to be very hard to minimize that function because, you know, let's say you figured out what the function is doing at a certain point. And then the function changes very rapidly. So at the point, at like at the next point, like at a point very close to it, the function could be something completely different. So uh, local information about the function's behavior at a point tells you very little about what it's doing or close by if the function changes very rapidly. So you need to have some control over how quickly the function can change. Otherwise, otherwise it's very hard to do minimization. And so this Lipschitz constant gives you a nice way of quantifying that. And it just, it's, it's a constant such that if you move some fixed distance in the domain, uh, then the distance you can move in the function space is at most g times that, that distance. So for example, think of x and y as two points in the domain that are, let's say, distance one apart. So if you move from x to y, you've moved distance one in the domain, then this Lipschitz constant equation says that the function value cannot change by more than g. So if you move um, distance one in the domain, you can at most move g in the range. That's what the Lipschitz constant is capturing. Um, okay, so now I can at least formally state the problem that we're going to be talking about for the rest of this talk, which is you're given a function. It has Lipschitz constant G. You want to minimize it on this ball of radius R around the origin. And what does the minimization mean? First, let's define X star as the minimum in this ball. So that's the, that's the point that achieves the minimum value of F in this ball of radius R. And our goal is to approximately minimize, so we don't need to figure out x star exactly, but we can just output some other point x, doesn't have to be x star, as long as it's epsilon close. And where epsilon close formally means that the function value at x minus the function value at x star is at most epsilon. So it's epsilon close to being the correct answer, which is x star. Okay, so this is the basic convex optimization problem that we're going to be looking at. All right. Look. And to, to state the optimality of gradient descent and so on, uh, I'll need to fix uh, a little more about the problem. So whenever you're presented with a computational problem, a, a great question to ask always is, how is the input specified? Because the complexity of a problem always depends on how the input is specified and different ways of specifying the input might change the complexity of the problem. So in, in convex optimization, there's many standard ways of specifying the function. Um, for, for example, there's what's called zeroth order convex optimization, where you only have access to the function f, uh, which means you can evaluate the function at any point of your choice. But but that's about it. But as you could as you can see in, in gradient descent, the what the algorithm wanted to do was it wanted to evaluate the gradient of the function. So so we're actually in the setting that's called first order convex optimization, where we can evaluate both the function and its gradient at any point of our choice. So that's the sense in which we have access to the function f. I just have a parenthetical remark for those of you who are uh, concerned about the function not being differentiable. Uh, so this, this can happen. As I said, a convex function doesn't have to be differentiable. In that case, we don't work with the gradient. We work with something called the subgradient. Maybe I'll, I'll say a sentence or two about it later, but uh, don't worry about it. It's not, not very important right now. Um, okay, and uh, we use the phrase black box to mean that you can evaluate the function f and the gradient of f at any point of your choice, uh, but you don't actually understand the function in any global meaningful way. So this, going back to the example of you know hiking in the mountains, this is 
like you can figure out your where you currently are and you can you can observe the slope of your location currently by just observing the area around you but you can't like look around for valleys because you know your view is being blocked by trees or or whatever that's the same kind of assumption here with the functions you you don't know what the function is doing everywhere you don't have any global understanding of the function but but you can evaluate the function at uh, a point of your choice and its gradient. So black box just refers to this fact that you want to, uh, if, if you're a programmer, the, the cleanest way of thinking over black box is that somebody has given you a subroutine that computes f and grad f, the gradient of f for you, and you can call this subroutine um, on any point of your choice, but but that's it. You don't, uh, you don't, um, you don't get to look at the source code of the subroutine, for example. That would be one way of saying that you don't understand the structure of the function and its gradient. Okay, now that we've formally defined these things, I can tell you what the problem is. It's the minimization problem that we defined on the previous slide. Uh, but what's the goal? The goal is at the end of the day, you want to output this approximate minimizer X and you want to evaluate F and grad F as few times as possible. So if you go back to the programming analogy, you want to make function calls to these two subroutines as few times as possible. That's the goal. And we're only going to count this. So our, our metric for evaluating how good an algorithm is going to be, how many times do you evaluate F and grad F? Okay, let me just copy this problem up there. And let's just observe that this problem seems to have four free parameters. So there's the dimension n that you're working in, the Lipschitz constant of the function g, the radius r, and the error epsilon to which you want to find an optimal solution. Uh, and although it seems like there's four parameters, really there's only two parameters. And that's because there's a freedom in the formulation of the problem, which is that you can scale the function's input and output spaces as you like. So you can just uh, take the function f and multiply it by some constant alpha that will scale the output space. And when you evaluate f on some input x, you can instead evaluate an f on like beta times x for some constant beta. So there, there's some freedom scaling the input and output spaces. And so it turns out that because of that, there's actually only two parameters. And the parameters are n and g times r over epsilon. So what are the best classical algorithms for solving this problem? So this problem has been studied uh, for, for a long time in the classical literature. And we understand this problem extremely well classically. And there are two, uh, essentially two different optimal algorithms depending on the regime in which you're working in. So the first class of algorithms is called the dimension independent algorithms and gradient descent is an example of this. And its complexity is G times R over epsilon squared. So what you'll notice, and of course the phrase dimension independent gives this away, there's no dependence on N, the dimension. Uh, and this is really nice, uh, especially in applications in uh, machine learning and optimization where the dimension of the space is very large. And if you can, you would really like to avoid uh, additional dependence on the dimension. And then there's this other class of algorithms, which are dimension dependent algorithms. And uh, some examples, you might have heard of the ellipsoid algorithm. That's an example of such an algorithm. And as you can see, its complexity depends on M. So in today's talk, uh, I want to talk about gradient descent. So I want to talk about dimension independent algorithms. And so let's let's just focus on the dimension independent case. So think of n as just being very large, like say polynomially larger than all the other parameters. So we don't want dependence on n. We just want some dependence on gr over epsilon. And as I said, gr over epsilon should will always appear together as a as a unit. So sometimes we we might just set g and r to be one and just talk about the epsilon complexity. OK, so gradient descent achieves this complexity. And uh, as I said on the last slide, gradient descent achieves this complexity. And now let me just tell you what gradient descent actually does for this problem formally. So previously, I just gave you like an intuitive version of what gradient descent does. But let me specify the algorithm in full detail. And you'll see it's a very simple algorithm. So this is what the algorithm does. Uh, and if you recall, previously there was a step size parameter. You had to decide how many steps to walk in the direction of a low gradient and that step size is going to be set to be epsilon uh, which is the parameter you're minimizing okay so what do you do um you start at the origin so you, you you're minimizing with a ball of unit radius around zero so you might as well start there because that's the center of your search space and now you just repeat this loop t times and t is going to be our complexity gr over epsilon squared and what does the loop do? It, it takes the point that you're currently at, x, xi. It does this one step in the direction of the gradient. Uh, the step's magnitude is eta. 
And finally, there's this little script P thing going on, which, which I didn't mention before. But this P just brings you back to the domain because you are minimizing in a ball of radius R. It could happen that one of your steps takes you outside this ball of radius R, but then you want to come back to the ball of radius R. So the projector onto the ball of radius R is just a fancy way of saying you look at where you are, and if you're uh, at a point that's more than R distance away from the origin, uh, you come back towards the origin and come back to distance R. Uh, of course, you want to do this because you want to stay within the domain that you're minimizing in. Otherwise, you'll just run off to some point that's not even in the domain you're minimizing, and you'll get some point that's not in the domain. Uh, so you do this t times, um, and finally, you output the average of all your uh, iterates, or of all the points that you've seen so far. So, okay, so that's, that's gradient descent. Uh, as you can see, the complexity really is gr over epsilon squared, because there's a loop over here that only runs for t times, and in each time you run the loop, it makes one uh, access to this gradient. So that's that's the complexity. That's the number of queries that are made to these subroutines or black boxes. So that part is easy to see. Why the complexity is gr over epsilon squared? The, the part that's not obvious is that this algorithm actually outputs an answer that's correct. So I'll just claim that this this happens. It's it's not very hard to work out. It's like about half a page of math, but I'll just state this for now. And perhaps the more interesting thing is that gradient descent cannot be improved upon. So, you know, if you recall our motivation for all of this was we wanted to find a problem that gradient descent solves and it solves optimally and no classical algorithm solves better. And this is that problem because you can also prove that any classical algorithm, even if it's randomized, so Gradient descent is a deterministic algorithm. It doesn't make any random choices. You know, the, the steps are all laid out over there, and there's no, there's no, you know, call to a random bits or, you know, RND function or anything like that. But even if you were allowed the algorithm to be randomized and you know have some small probability of failure, even then there's no classical algorithm that's dimension independent that improves on gradient descent. So any classical algorithm must make at least gr over epsilon squared queries. So this, uh, if you haven't seen this before, the big omega just ref ref says that the it, it must be at least gr over epsilon squared, or, or formally it says it's asymptotically at least gr over ep epsilon squared. So this shows that gradient descent is, is optimal among classical algorithms. And so um, this is an aside about what happens when we have non-differentiable points. Um, maybe I won't say too much about this, but if you're really worried about this, I'll just say, um, there is something you can use instead of a gradient called a subgradient, and it satisfies many of the property that, properties that a gradient satisfies. So a gradient needs to satisfy this equation. Um, I mean, it always does uh, for convex functions. And it turns out that you can, if you put in some other vector over here that satisfies this equation, um, that's uh, that would be called a subgradient. And even though the gradients may not always be defined, because the function may not be differentiable, uh, subgradients are always defined for convex functions, and so you just use these subgradients instead of gradients. The the only issue is it might not be unique, uh, but it's not. It turns out it's not a problem. Like the, the, everything works. Everything I've said so far just works perfectly, even if things are not differentiable. So just forget about non-differentiability. And yeah, so that that brings us to our question: Can quantum computers speed up gradient descent? And I finally formalized the question the way that I promised earlier. We found a problem that gradient descent solved optimally, um, and so this is this is my this is my formalization. We 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 found this problem that I described earlier, and two important facts about this problem: gradient descent solves this problem, and it makes so many queries, gr over epsilon squared, and no classical algorithm can do better. In fact, even if you allow the classical algorithm, the ability to make error and make random choices and so on. So, this problem finally fits the bill, and it's it's very. Um, it's a very basic problem in convex optimization. You'll, you'll yeah, find it in any book. So it seems like really the natural question to consider when we're asking this question of can quantum computers speed up gradient descent? And of course, now the question is, can quantum computers solve this problem faster? OK, I hope uh, I hope that made sense so far. Maybe I'll just pause if there's questions. If not, um, yeah, let me just say this was maybe a, a, a long-winded journey uh, starting from this informal question to bring us to the formal version of the question, but I, I wanted to tell you 
um, how these things often go. You know, so we often start out with some informal question and then you choose to formalize it in one way. This is not the only way to formalize the problem. Right? That's, that's important. Um, and um, yeah, and this happens everywhere. Like I'm, I'm sure you have I mean, this might be more obvious when you're thinking about um, experimental sciences. You know, like you want to, you know, figure out if some, I don't know, some 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 supplement helps you to fight some disease, and then the experimental researcher will design some kind of clinical trial where they'll give this uh, supplement to patients of the disease and so on. But there's so many choices to be made, like how you interpret the question of does it help, and you know, what dosage and so on. So it's it's that kind of thing when you start with an intuitive form problem you have to formalize it uh, rigorously into a mathematical question here because this is theoretical computer science and you know we can mathematically prove things but there's always some art in formalizing the question okay so this is the question that we decided to look at and uh, now that we've defined the question i need to explain what it means for a quantum algorithm to solve this problem and what it means is you know we had access to the input the, which was this function f and gradient of f Classically, we said that you have you just have subroutines that will evaluate f and grad f for you at any point of your choice. You you want to allow the analogy quantumly, and this is a very standard notion in quantum algorithms. Uh, but uh, let me explain it to you. I don't want to assume that people know what what it means to give quantum access to a, a function. And for for simplicity, to start out with this explanation, let's start with a, a simpler function. So we, we were thinking of functions that take n real numbers and output one real number, but let's think of a function that takes in n bits and outputs one bit. Okay, so uh, uh, such a function is called a Boolean function because um, it's accepting as input and output uh, booleans or just bits. So it takes in n bits and it outputs one bit. Uh, so let, let's look at the classical situation. So uh, wh what do we mean that we have classical access to this function as a black box? What we mean is that you have some box in this in this picture. It is unfortunately not black; it's gray. But this is the black box. To this black box, you can submit any input of your choice. So x will now be n bits instead of being n real numbers that we were previously thinking of. You'll submit these n bits, and the black box will do its thing. It'll evaluate f on these n bits and output this one bit answer f of x. Right, so this is what you imagine having subroutine access to a function f um, as uh, in, in code. You just you can call f on any x of your choice, but that's it. You don't get to look inside the source code of f. There's a standard way to convert this to a quantum black box. OK, so this is the first time uh, I'm introducing quantum notation. So um, I'm assuming that you, since you're here at this quantum talk, you're you maybe you've seen this before, but uh, if not, essentially what it means is this notation says that I submit as input a, a quantum state that encodes X. In this case, th this is just saying I submit the cl uh, a classical basis state corresponding to X, and I submit a dummy bit B. So B is uh, a dummy register. It's either zero or one, it's just a bit. And what the Oracle is going to do, or what this uh, quantum black box is going to do, it's going to leave my input uh, untouched. It's not going to do anything to the input, and it's just going to copy the answer f of x into the second register, but it's not going to override it. It's going to XOR it. So this, this symbol means XOR, or what that means. Uh, so that's logical exclusive OR, and all that means is it's going to take, if, if b is 0, then this register will just be f of x, and if b is 1, then it's going to be the complement of f of x. And the reason we do it this way is um, that in quantum algorithms, it turns out that all of your subroutines have to be unitary processes or unitary matrices so that's a that's a, that's a, bit, that's a technical thing but the, the maybe the short version the intuitive version is that uh, all quantum processes need to be reversible and this uh, operation on the left is not reversible so what do i mean by reversible i mean that once you put something in so you put an x and you get the output f of x you should be able to recover the input from the output and this doesn't happen over here because f of x is just one number it's just one bit in fact it cannot you cannot recover x from it. But here, um, from this answer, you can actually recover these two. And one way to see that you can recover it is you can just apply this operation uf again to the answer, and you will, in fact, get back x and b. So this 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 operation uf is actually its own uh, reverse. It's its own inverse. And that's a, that's a requirement on quantum algorithms that subroutines be reversible. 
and this is why um, this is the standard way to define the quantum version of this. Okay, so uh, if you don't if you if you don't care about the technical details, it, it's it's not it's not very important that this is how we define it, but it is important that you have a level playing field. So it's it's important that the quantum access you assume to the function is not more powerful than the classical access you assume. So classically, we assume that somebody had written, say, a program or something for f and the gradient of f. Um, so you should have something comparable in the quantum world. And this is exactly the right thing to do. And the justification for this is, um, I'm going to say this in terms of a, a classical circuit, but it's equally good with a classical algorithm. Let me say what I mean is if you had a classical circuit to compute this function f and it used some g number of gates, so that's the cost of the circuit, then the, you can come up with a quantum circuit uf that does the operation on the right and it'll use only order g number of quantum gates, so roughly the same number of gates. So what we're saying is, or I can say the same thing in terms of algorithms, so if you had a classical algorithm that ran in some time t and computed f, then you can take that algorithm and in a completely straightforward way, make it into a quantum algorithm, and now it'll run in time order t. So that might be some constant factor overhead, but it's not a big deal. And it'll compute u of f. So given classical source code for the thing on the left, I can, in a completely mechanical way, produce um, quantum source code for the thing on the right. So that's why this is a fair apples to apples comparison. Like I'm taking an object that you can create from the classical object, but now this object on the right-hand side is well-suited for quantum algorithms to use in, in, within the algorithm. So, okay, so that's how you formally define quantum black boxes for Boolean functions. And I, I don't want to get into the technical details of how you do this with real numbers, because real numbers are kind of annoying because real numbers have infinite precision and so on. And maybe I'll just say one sentence about it is for real numbers, we assume this same model, but they're, they're just, they're not actually real numbers. They're just numbers specified to arbitrarily large precision. So maybe you're just given a lot of bits of the real number, maybe polynomially many bits, and then the same setup just works. Hey, Robin, hey, Robin I have a couple of questions. questions. Sure, yeah. So, so um, Eric, Eric asks, asks is, is G, G as number, number of gates is. the same as G in the Lipschitz, Lipschitz uh, constant? Uh, good, good, yeah. Uh, no, no, it's not. I should not have used G. Yeah, um, maybe I should use T for time or something. It's just w whatever number of gates um, you need to compute F or whatever amount of time, it's completely equivalent to think of in terms of time, that it takes to compute F, you'll use roughly the same amount of time or gates to compute UF. Great. And then Nathan asks, um, will you talk about the implications for non-COVEX optimization as well? Ah, that's a great question. So no, no. So I won't talk about non-convex optimization um, uh, because you know the problem we chose to represent this power of gradient descent is a convex optimization problem. Um, and the reason I'm not talking about non-convex optimization, for one thing, in many non-convex settings, it's very hard to prove that gradient descent does find a minimum for you. So um, in, in fact, it, it it may not. It'll get it'll often get stuck in local minimum, minima. Um, uh, yeah, I didn't say this about convex functions, but one of the reasons we really like convex functions is convex functions don't have uh, local minima to get trapped in. So if there's a local minimum, it's also a global minimum. So if you find some place where your derivative is zero and everything around you uh, is larger than your current value, then you're, you've actually found the minimum. Non-convex functions don't have this property, uh, so it's very hard to even state uh, what you want to happen. You can, and there are ways to formalize this, and um, I have been thinking about this with my collaborators, but we 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 aren't sure. Uh, yeah, we can't answer this question for non-convex functions right now. Uh, but I should say it's 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 already very hard to formalize what you want gradient descent to do in that setting. And uh, in subtle settings, gradient descent might not even be the correct classical algorithm for non-convex optimization. Right. So one of the things I said before is we want to choose a problem for which gradient descent is the best classical algorithm to use. And it could turn out classically that. Um, in the non-convex setting, you shouldn't use gradient descent. You should use something completely different. So it is a little tricky to formalize the question for non-convex problems, and this is something we're thinking about. But right now, I don't have anything to, uh, yeah, anything to report on this question. Thanks, Robin. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Feel free to keep typing in questions. 
All right, so this was the yeah, this is the way we formalized the question, and uh, yeah, so now in the last part of the talk, let me tell you a little bit about why. Um, so so yeah, again, in continuing the story of you know how this research pro project progressed. So we came to this point, we formalized the question, we decided this is the question we're looking at. It's a very natural question. It's a very basic problem in convex optimization. Can quantum computers solve this problem faster? And one of the first things you can look at in such in this kind of scenario where you already know what the best classical algorithm is and you know the classical algorithm is optimal. So that means there is uh, some proof of optimality and what that proof of optimality must contain is an instance or uh, um, an example of a problem or a family of functions where the classical algorithm uh, cannot do any better than what gradient descent does. Right? So that's what it means to say a classical algorithm is optimal. It means that there is some uh, family of functions for which no classical algorithm could do better than what gradient descent does. So that means you have some explicit family of functions that appear in this mathematical proof. So you can inspect those functions. You can look at the, that class of functions and you can ask, can quantum computers do better on that specific class of functions? This doesn't mean the quantum computers solve the problem for all functions, but uh, it's a start because we know these functions are hard because they appear in the in the in the mathematical proof showing that gradient descent cannot do very good much better on this class of functions and so it's always instructive to look at what is the idea that's being used in the classical lower bound proof and so when i say lower bound i mean the the proof that no algorithm uh, can do any better than gr over epsilon whole squared queries uh, and uh, I'll, it, it's not very important what this function is, but uh, I'll, I'll just show it to you because it's it's kind of it's kind of kind of cute. And uh, as I said before, gr over epsilon always appears as a unit. So without loss of generality, you could just set two of them to be one, and it's it's canonical to set g and r to be one. So there's only one parameter really, epsilon. And as I said, the dimension can be very large, so you can choose it to be arbitrarily large. I'm just going to choose it to be one over epsilon squared. And it turns out that the proof uses this class of functions. So uh, Z is some string of length N of plus, plus ones and minus ones. And the function, which is parameterized by Z now, it looks like this. It takes ZI, it multiplies it by XI, and it takes the maximum over all I. And it turns out that this function is indeed Lipschitz with constant one. Um, you can you can kind of work this out on a piece of paper uh, what the optimal point is. It turns out that this is the optimal point. It's just um, so. What do you want to do? You want to minimize this function, right? So that means you want um, zi and xi. Uh, so if if zi is is negative, then you want uh, xi to be positive. If zi is positive, you want xi to be negative. So you want it to have the opposite sign. Uh, but otherwise, it should have the same component in each each of the directions. Uh, zi. So it turns out you should just sum up the zi's and put a minus sign up front. And the overall constant is just so that this 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 point lies inside the unit ball. So as we said, you've got to be in a ball of radius r and r is set to one. And then you can evaluate what the function is at this point x star. It turns out to be this thing. Okay, whatever. So now we understand what the classical lower bound is, um, it, the hard instances. And it turns out that this is the thing you need to prove to establish the optimality of gradient descent that any classical algorithm, even if it's randomized, must make one over epsilon squared queries, which is our lower bound gr over epsilon squared from before because g and r are one. OK, so the thing to do, as I said, is let's just look at this class of functions and ask, can quantum computers do better on this specific class of functions? Um, so I've just copied down the functions on the, this slide. OK. Um, and let's let's observe something interesting about this class of functions. And so I want to observe um, three things. So let's start with what happens if you send as input x being all ones, right? So we get to evaluate the function f at any input of our choice. So we could just send in the the vector of all ones. And if all of them are ones, so that all the x i's equal one. So then it just does the max of z i. It just tells you the largest z i. And z i's are either plus one or minus one. So the output of the function will be plus one if and only if there exists some zi which is equal to plus one. Otherwise, the maximum will be minus one. OK, so that's cool. So the all ones vector tells you something interesting. It tells you if there exists a zi that's equal to one. But instead of sending in the all ones vector, you can send in a vector that's one on a subset s. This is called an indicator vector of a set s. And what this will do is it'll tell you if there, the answer will be evaluated to one if and only if there is a zi within the indices i and s 
uh, with where zi is equal to one. So you can select a subset of the n bits in the input string and ask, do these bits contain a one? So in other words, we can make queries of the form, does z contain a plus one within the set s that I, I will specify? And these are sometimes called subset or queries because you get to select a subset and on that subset you get to do a logical or because you have a bunch of bits and you want to know if any of them is one. This is the logical or operation. And now uh, this is the this is the fun part. It turns out that it was already known, uh, shown by um, uh, Alexander Spelovs, that if you have this kind of query, a subset or query to, a, to an n bit string, you can actually learn the whole string with only square root of n quantum queries. And in this case, what would happen is you would learn all of Z. And once you've learned Z, we know what the optimal point is because on the previous slide, we expressed the answer X star in terms of Z. So that means you can learn the, the optimal X star after only making square root of N quantum queries. And um, N was one over epsilon squared over here. So in fact, you get a quadratic speed up over the classical algorithm. So in other words, quantum algorithms solve this hard family of functions quadratically faster than classical algorithms, in particular faster than gradient descent. Uh, so, oh, let me, yeah, okay, let me, let me just pause on this slide so you can keep looking at it if you, if you want to, and I'll, I'll, I'll pause for if there's any questions. Okay. So, all right, so what's going on? Okay, so now there's a, we're down a long and winding road, right? So what's happened? Like the, so, so some interesting stuff's going on. We we formalized our question. We asked, we found, we said, you know, can quantum computers solve this problem faster than classical algorithms? We already know that classical algorithms must make one over epsilon squared queries, which is what gradient descent does. Uh, so we, we, can, we can prove that. And in that proof, there is a family of functions that it, that is used in the mathematical proof, uh, which is uh, the hardest family of functions for classical algorithms, because um, that's the thing that witnesses the fact that you must make one or epsilon squared queries classically. But our quantum algorithm solves this family of functions quadratically faster than gradient descent. It solves it, in fact, with one or epsilon queries. So what's going on? Um, and I want to say this is exactly what happened in our research project. Like so, uh, this, this story is chronologically accurate. So we got to this point and we were like, uh, wait a second, the quantum algorithm is quadratically faster than gradient descent on the hardest classical instance for gradient descent and for all classical algorithms. So what does this mean? Does this mean quantum algorithms actually just solve this problem quadratically faster always? Or was this a coincidence? Just that this specific function family that was used in this classical lower barn is hard for classical algorithms, but not hard for quantum algorithms. So, so we, we reached this point. Um, and yeah, so is it is it just a, a thing that you can always do, get a quadratic speed up, or is it a coincidence? And then we worked on this problem for many months, and um, this is the, I guess, the part of the story that's not as interesting as a story, because it's just a lot of work and a lot of looking at different functions and trying to understand where quantum algorithms could get stuck and so on. But I'll cut to the chase and I'll just tell you the, the final uh, conclusion. Uh, what we show is that there's actually a different family of hard functions uh, for which even quantum algorithms must make one or epsilon squared queries. In, in other words, there's no quantum speed up over gradient descent in this setting. So in this way that we have chosen to formalize the problem, which is this setting of first order con black box convex optimization, there's no quantum speed up. So it's a negative result. So as I was saying, at the beginning of the talk, um, you know, I like to investigate problems and look at whether or not there's a quantum speed up. And regardless of the outcome you achieve, whether you do discover a new quantum speed up or whether you can prove that there is no quantum speed up, both of these are very um, good outcomes. Um, the worst outcome is where you don't, where you can't conclude anything at the end of the day. So you can neither prove that there's a better quantum algorithm, nor can you prove that there's no better quantum algorithm. So you, you just don't know. If you settle the question either way, that's always great. So now I know this, and I'm not going to spend time trying to improve, uh, come up with improved quantum algorithms for in this exact setting of first order black box convex optimization. Of course, it doesn't mean that there cannot be speed ups in other settings you know, where you change it on some of the parameters, but at least it settles it for this. Um, yeah, since we're pretty close to time, let me not get into the technical details of the, the quantum algorithm, uh, the quantum lower bound proof. Um, 
it uh, I'll just I'll just tell you what the, the function looks looks like. It's a, this was the classical function used. The quantum function is a, a scarier looking function, I guess. And what's going on is instead of using these uh, zi xi by zi by bits, turns out you have to use the inner product of vi and x, and vi is are uh, ortho normal random vectors and you also have to add this additive term uh, that depends on the norm of the function x and also depends on the index and there's a lot of stuff going on um, those of you who are familiar with quantum lower bounds might be wondering what technique was used to prove this lower bound and because this is a very non-standard setting like where we have access to real number queries and so on uh, most of the standard techniques for proving quantum lower bounds don't seem to work like those of you who are familiar with quantum lower bound techniques, the standard ones are the adversary method and the polynomial method. We were not able to get those to work, but uh, there's something called the hybrid argument, which, which is in fact uh, probably the first quantum lower bound technique. That one still works in this setting. And so we use that and this function and some ideas from a very recent classical paper on, on parallel lower bounds for gradient descent to, to establish this. Okay, maybe that's all I want to say about the technical stuff. Um, hey, Robin. Yeah, we have a question. OK, uh, go ahead. Can you speculate about variations of the problem that might give quantum speed up? Sure. So right, so variations of the problem. So actually, let me just go to my this was going to be my last slide, so I'll just I'll just keep this slide open. Um, and yeah, are there uh, yeah, variations of the problem? So this is kind of related to this third question here, which I, I, I've also been thinking about. So are there other natural settings in optimization where you could get quantum speed up? Um, and you know, so in, in our setting, we assumed that our function was um, Lipschitz and it was not necessarily smooth. It was not differentiable. You couldn't, uh, the, the gradient may not exist anywhere. The other very standard setting in uh, convex optimization is a smooth convex optimization. So here you have to, you can assume that the function is differentiable everywhere and the derivative is not very large. Um, this is a um, setting that uh, maybe is even more studied than the Lipschitz setting. I don't know, maybe equally well studied. Um, so here we thought perhaps there might be a quantum speed up and we've been working on this project for a while and now we're pretty confident that in this setting as well we can prove that there is no quantum speed up unfortunately um, but there are many yeah there are many different settings where you could uh, play around with what's going on um, you know you could uh, you could go to non-convex optimization as one of the earlier questions asked but even in convex optimization you could instead of having first order access where you have access to the function and the gradient you could have second order access or third order access so this would mean higher order derivatives of the function um, in many of these cases it turns out that gradient descent is not the classic best classical algorithm to apply anyway actually even in this case of smooth convex functions the best classical algorithm is not gradient descent you should use uh, an algorithm called accelerated gradient descent which is optimal so right now so to answer your question all the settings that i uh, that we have looked at we there's many of them and for most of them we don't know the right answer as i was saying before like the default state of knowledge is we just don't know the the, the one or two settings where we actually be able to prove something mathematically it seems like we don't get speed ups over gradient descent um, yeah so that would be my answer great um we have another question um you showed that for a small family of functions that you do get a quantum speed up, but not generally. Do you have any intuition on what other subfamilies of functions might also have a speed up? Yeah, yeah, this is also a great question. In fact, this is open problem number one that I've stated over here. So these are all great questions because these are also questions to which I don't know the answer, but I would really like to know the answer. Um, from what we can tell currently, the property that, that was used was somewhat specific that you you get these subset or queries and this algorithm of Bellows works and gives you a quadratic speed up. Um, it's we weren't able to formulate it into an interesting class of functions that you could describe as some natural class that appears like you know one thing that we, we thought maybe you could describe it as is the, the function must always be the maximum of a bunch of linear functions because that's those functions are all linear and then it's a max. Uh, but it's not even clear if we can uh, achieve speed of sort of max up linear functions. Um, uh, in fact, I don't think that's true. So we were not able to come up with 
uh, any class that includes the class that we can get a quadratic speed of four that would somehow be natural or that you could sell to anyone by saying, uh, hey, look at this reasonable class of functions. We get quantum speed ups on it. Um, we don't have that yet, but there could very well be, I, but I just don't know. Great, thanks. Um, let's see, are, are you ready for some? I think there's one more question in the queue. Um, did you have anything else to add to your um, talk there, Robin? Uh, no, I think I just wanted to touch on these open problems, but uh, yeah, problems one and three have already been covered um, by the, the questions we received. Maybe I'll just say something about the second question, which is we, we've been working in this dimension independent setting where gradient descent is optimal, but the, uh, the other end of the spectrum is also very interesting, which is where uh, gradient descent is not the right algorithm to use. Uh, you should use uh, one of these classical cutting plane algorithms like the ellipsoid method and make something like order n times some log. Let's forget about the log. So it makes roughly order n queries. In this setting, the best quantum lower bounds we have are only root n. So this is again a scenario where we know that quantum algorithms cannot get more than a quadratic speed up, but it is it is possible and completely consistent with current knowledge that you could get a quadratic speed up. So this is another setting in optimization that is tantalizingly open. Um, it's not related to gradient descent, as I said, because the optimal classic algorithm is not gradient descent, but it is an optimization problem and it comes up all over the place. And we're very interested in trying to close this gap, but we've been unsuccessful. Um, yeah, that was all the open problems I want to talk about. So yeah, I'm happy to take more questions now. Great. Um, one more question that I see. Are there other situations uh, where gradient descent is used where one might hope for a quantum speed up? Um, yeah, I guess. Uh, uh, gradient descent is often used in, in many settings where you can't prove it works or you, you can't prove that it'll find the minimum. And uh, this is yeah related to one of the very early questions about what happens in non-convex optimization. So in non-convex optimization, uh, th there are scenarios we can prove that it works, but it's not. Um, uh, I mean, it, you, know, you have to define what it works means in, in those cases. So um, I think there's certainly a lot of places one could investigate. So it, by no means does this um, close the question of quantum computer speeding up gradient descent, but it, at least it does say in this very uh, basic, you know, textbook example of uh, optimality of gradient descent. In this setting, you cannot speed up gradient descent. Um, and as I was saying, we have some further work where we're investigating smooth functions where we think we also can't speed up classical algorithms. Um, so, yeah. Um, I guess what I can say is just we yeah we don't know what the final situation is going to be, but gradient descent is used in many different places, and there can be different ways to formalize the use of gradient descent in those other applications, uh, which would uh, I guess all be worth looking at just because gradient descent is so popular in in practice. And also one should look at other variations of gradient descent. As I said, accelerated gradient descent is another variation of gradient descent that's used in some settings, such as when the function is smooth. There's also stochastic gradient descent, which is very popular for training neural networks. Um, yeah, just a host of algorithms uh, for all of which you could ask the same question, and uh, most of these problems are unsolved, and they remain very interesting questions. Great. Thank you so much, Robin. We are um, a little bit past our 4 p.m. So um, really appreciate you um, speaking at the event and, and giving a really interesting and, and great talk. Um, so this uh, concludes the third installment of the Northwest Quantum Nexus seminar series. Um, I do like would like to um, direct our attendees um, to the nwquantum.com website um, for more information. NQN and some upcoming events, including um, the December seminar, uh, which is uh, being scheduled right now. So please uh, visit the website, um, get updates on when that seminar is going to take place. And again, thanks everyone for your attending um, and have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you so much. Thanks, Robin. Thanks.